Okay, so my name is Raina Harris and I'm a graduate student at the University of Texas in Austin. I'm in a cellular and molecular biology PhD program. When did I first get interested in science? <clears throat> I think uh, high school chemistry was probably the first time I remember being really interested in science. Uh, it, was, it came really naturally and I noticed that that was unusual, that it wasn't natural for any of my peers and it seemed really cool. I don't know, uh, stoichiometry made sense and I actually thought it was pretty cool. I think great teachers are always important. Those are always my favorite classes, even if the subject isn't all that interesting. If the subject is interesting and the teacher is bad, then the class isn't, doesn't have as profound an impact as when there's a great teacher. The first time I was here was in 2013 for the summer course in Neural Systems and Behavior. My role, so in 2013, my PI, Hans Hoffman, and a, another PI, Andre Fenton, took over as co-directors. It's a five-year commitment. Uh, they both come in together and work together for five years as directors, and then they leave. And together, they both decided that they wanted to innovate the course in a variety of ways with uh, new technology, new research questions, new experimental paradigms, new technologies, and they wanted to embark on bring their own research here. And, and because when you're at an MBL, there's this amazing collaborative environment with there's lots of inspiration and cross fostering of ideas. And so they wanted to bring their own research labs here. And so I was brought on to do research for the most part and you also bring in new approaches to the course. So I do also teach as part of the course. So the project that I'm working on, it's a collaboration with Andre Fenton and Hans Hoffman. We, Andre works on learning and memory in rodent model systems, using mostly electrophysiological techniques to understand how memories are formed in, in the brain. And then my role is to add another level on top of that and to interrogate, well, what is a molecular memory? And where are these memories formed and what does it look like molecularly? So if we know what neurons uh, show electrophysiological properties that are indicative of memory, what are the corresponding molecular techniques? So my favorite story last year, uh, I was working with two girls on their independent project. Uh, the, the way the course works is you have one week to teach students new techniques, new approaches, new questions, new thoughts, of new lines of thought, and maybe a new model system. And then they have a week to work on their special project. And the students came up with this beautiful project where we were synthesizing a double-stranded RNA to knock down gene expression in single neurons of the crab. And, they, and then we were going to measure the gene expression changes and the electrophysiological changes. And for about three days, we couldn't get the injection to work. And they slaved over, they stayed up all night, tried a bunch of different things. And then finally, uh, there was this moment where it finally worked and the girls were cheering. And we caught it on, on camera, this, like, this moment of joy when you finally overcome these challenges. And, uh, and then you have a little bit less time than you thought to do the subsequent experiments, but we still did them. And, and that was a really great moment. I think it really transformed their thinking and brought their enthusiasm back. You're, you get really frustrated when things fail. And to see that if you just persevere and keep going, that uh, you'll reap the benefits. And then this year, we're, we're continuing to elaborate on these approaches. So it was worth it. Yeah, so in, in the Hoffman lab where I'm doing my PhD, we're mostly interested in social behavior, their evolution, uh, how, they, how they change over time or in response to stimuli. And so for the most part, we are interested in really complex behaviors, mating systems or parental care or the stress response. And these are really complex behaviors. They're made up of uh, many Neurons need to, many neurons are important for these, many brain regions, many uh, organs. It's complex movement. And so it's very hard to get down to studying one neuron and how it affects this behavior. And so it's been really nice to complement 
this research that we do, which is often on the organismal level, or we look at many neurons firing and how they influence behavior, to see how people are making really profound uh, insights into behavior setting, not simple is the wrong word, but, but different behaviors, such as swimming or, or crawling and understanding how one neuron regulates backward movement. It's, 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 I like the approach. They're, they're complementary, and I think we both, for instance, the C. elegans community, which can study one neuron and one behavior, I think it's really awesome to see how their research impacts our research and how our thinking can impact their thinking as well. This, they're both important. They're, they have a very different perspective and an end goal, uh, but it's nice to see how what we can learn from studying single cells in smaller organisms with a defined neural circuit and going up to mammals or, or more complex vertebrates. So at the University of Texas, I'm part of what's called the Center for Computational Biology and Bioinformatics. And basically the, the idea is that uh, bioinformatics is increasingly becoming a part of every graduate student's toolkit. Uh, you almost can't get through your PhD without learning how to at least utilize code, if not write and edit your own code. And so there's not that much formal training in it. Some people are fortunate enough to have that as a, in high school or in undergrad, but many graduate students come in without that, tech, without that expertise. And so what we do is, is sort of fourfold. Try to empower the students by teaching them the skills that they need to analyze their large data sets. Uh, we provide bioinformatic consulting when they have hit a wall and are like, well, I've exhausted all the expertise of my PI or of the postdoc that was training me. We have bioinformatic consultants that can help them uh, learn to analyze their own data or how to um, help them develop a new pipeline. We also provide some hardware support so you can actually store this massive amounts of data that you collected. And then we are building a community, offering travel awards and hosting symposia and, and networking events both within the university and in, in academia. So I think it's really, one of the things I've learned from neural systems and behavior here at MBL is that immersion in, in a community is one of the most profound impacts that it has on your career. Like learning the technology is sort of secondary and it's not even the, the main goal. So I think by building a community where you can uh, empower people is, is more important. And that's one of the things that we're trying to do with computational biology and bioinformatics at, at UT Austin. So the best thing is the ratio. So MBL, it, it's designed, so it's designed not as a summer camp, but it's designed as a place where people can come from all over the world. And we have the housing facility and there's a system in place that that makes it easy for visitors to come. That is unlike a home institution where having visitors can require, it's not the easiest process. And so what happens is you have students who are eager to learn here and you have nearly a one-to-one -one ratio of faculty that are here to both gain insight and novel ideas from students and teach and you know pass on what they know. And so the best thing is that where at home most PIs are at their desk answering emails, being on committees, going to seminars. And here, they're actually at their rig. They're actually at their bench, and they're doing science. And so my favorite thing about being here is seeing PIs working together on a project at 2 AM and, and seeing PIs spend four hours with a student one-on-one -on -one at a rig trying to solve a new problem or trying to teach them. So it's the focus of the PIs on um, just giving the student any opportunity they can to succeed and to learn and grow. I think that's what it is. And uh, the, so it's not necessarily, the, the facilities are important, the, the reagents and the tools and the technology is important, but it's really the people that, that make it so special. Yeah, um, so one of the really cool things is that I've, I'm here at this time where there's sort of a transition. So uh, the first time I was here was in 2013, and now this year there's a new director and, and potentially a new vision for how this place is running. And my, along those same lines, when in 2013 I was bringing molecular approaches, and which are not the cheapest thing, and most of it are consumables that aren't renewable. 
You're using enzymes and reagents that aren't renewable. And Promega is a, a company that they, for the first time, started a collaboration with MBL, providing all these supplies, uh, donating all these supplies. And so when I was starting to come and think about what I would do here, I took all of what I knew how to do at home using different companies' products, and I was like, okay, now I'm going to use Promega. And, and then, but they, they not only gave me supplies, they also brought in a team of people, and they brought in their, their CEO, who, whose vision is not that by donating us a bunch of reagents that we'll then go on to buy them at home and we'll, that they'll get their money back in return. Their, their vision is that they empower scientists and that they um, build this community. And so I think that it's been really cool to see how, uh, how companies benefit from being here and understanding like, different people's goals. Like Everybody has a different goal for being here. And, and seeing the, the cross interaction between industry and academia and, and the MBL and how it brings together people from all different stages of their career has been really cool. And to be able to experience what people's vision for the future of MBL is. So lots of faculty here. We, as we're having a few beers at the end of the day, um, it's really great to hear their insight about what, what worked well in the past and what they think might work well in the future. And to be here at this time of, of change and of uh, plasticity, if you will, of, of the vision and the future direction for MBL and neural systems and behavior. Can we start over? <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, I don't